Hello, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Pandemic Data Initiative's fourth expert forum. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a leader within the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. Today, we'll focus on the role that public health data has played in hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll discuss changes in data collection, analysis, and dissemination that are necessary to support healthcare workers and inform the public both now and in the future. Over 22 months ago, Johns Hopkins launched the Coronavirus Resource Center to collect, report, and analyze COVID-19 data from local, state, and federal government agencies in the United States and around the world. Millions know us for the global map that provides real-time data visualization of the pandemic. The overwhelming positive response and traffic to this first-of-its-kind effort revealed just how critical this data is and how much interest the public has in data to inform important decisions in their daily lives. But our work also revealed a major shortcoming. Everyone interprets and manages this data differently, and that's what inspired us to start the Pandemic Data Initiative. Our goal with the PDI is to highlight all of the lessons surrounding public health data that we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. We're especially interested in how we can best prepare our data infrastructure to spot future health crises earlier and to manage them better. Today is the fourth of several forums we plan to host to discuss what worked in COVID-19 public data management, what didn't work, and how to improve moving forward. As part of today's forum, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A with our speakers. Please do submit questions for our experts in the window at the bottom of your screen. I'm now going to introduce each of our panelists. I'm joined today by four guests who can speak to every level of hospitalization data from collection to aggregation to dissemination. Beth Blauer is Associate Vice Provost for Public Sector Innovation at Johns Hopkins, and she's the data lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center. Beth will be speaking about the timeline of COVID-19 hospitalization data and its role in contextualizing other pandemic data streams. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Brian Garibaldi, who's the clinical lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center, as well as medical director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit. Dr. Garibaldi is an associate professor of medicine with expertise in pulmonary and critical care medicine, acute lung injury, and interstitial lung disease. Then we'll turn to Dr. Hernando Garzon, who's joining us from California, where he serves as the lead for the California Department of Public Health's hospital data and analytics team. Dr. Garzon is a practicing emergency medicine physician with extensive background on healthcare emergency management and hospital operations, which has led to his involvement in crisis response spanning the terrorist attacks of September 11th to Hurricane Katrina, as well as international natural disasters. He's also the interim medical director for the California EMS Authority. Finally, Craig Bem is the executive director for CRISP, the state-designated Health Information Exchange, or HIE, for Maryland and Washington, D.C. In that role, Craig leads all statewide HIE activities, including customer engagement, product implementation, and reporting services. He works directly with state agencies to support Maryland's total cost of care model and population health programs. Craig is also an instructor at UMBC's master's program in health information technology, where he teaches quality and process improvement. Thank you all for joining me today. I know we're going to have a great discussion. Beth, I'm now going to turn to you for an overview. Thank you so much, Lainey. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. I feel uh, very lucky to be in your presence today. Um, even in this virtual world. Um, I, I want to start today um, first um, by really giving um, a high level overview of where we are right now. I know many of you have participated in our forums in the past um, who are follow our work on the pandemic data initiative have um, really um, been with us on this uh, journey where we've been talking about the ways that we depict COVID um, and the data that we rely on. Um, but I want to make sure that we all understand that we look at data that 
really informs decision making, whether that's public policy decision making, whether that's health decision making, whether that's hospital based decision making, um, that is really coalesced around um, a core set of measures. And so I put together some slides. And if we can go to the um, to the first slide, and I want to just remind everyone the, the the kinds of data that we look at um, as we think about um, uh, COVID. So the, the big four that we have looked at here at um, the uh, Pandemic Data Initiative and within the CRC have been from the very beginning, case data, death data, testing data, hospitalization data, and now we also are looking at vaccination data. Um, and one of the things that we talk a lot about is the fact that there have not been a consistent set of standards that have really told aggregators of this information and data, how they should be collecting it, what defines elements of this data. So we have variability in the way that this data is collected. So what you're seeing here is just a snapshot of the state of Maryland. Um, and you can see that there are um, a lot of, um, there's a lot of noisiness in this data. Um, and, and you can see a lot of variability. But one of the things that I'm going to call your attention to is the hospitalization data, which is the third line on this um, uh, plot. And it really feels a lot smoother. And one of the reasons that we point to for hospitalization to be smoother um, is the fact that um, over the last uh, two years, the federal government has dramatically changed the way that they collect hospitalization data and really created a standard around hospitalization data. So around July of 2020, they started to think about how they could improve data collection. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that timeline. But one of the things I want to just echo while we're still here on this slide is that this is still a composite. While hospitalization data emerged at that time as one of the strongest data sets that really helped us understand how acute the situation with COVID was in our communities, we still have to rely on the case data and the death data and the test data to really understand how to deploy key public health assets like testing or vaccination, um, how to how to deploy the right messaging to populations who may not have um, the right information to protect themselves with the key mitigation strategies of mask wearing and social distancing. And so the data has been driving a lot of the personal decisions that we're making and also the system decisions that we're making. And hospitalization data has played a very key role. And as you know now, as you've heard about in the news with hospitals being stretched and those limitations, a really tight look or eye on hospitalization has been critical. So I want to take us through this um, and, and, and um, we'll also post these slides on uh, the Pandemic Data Initiative website. So you'll have the opportunity to dig into this a little bit. Um, but this is a timeline of how um, the hospitalization data had evolved. So before October of 2020, hospitalization data um, was more of a voluntarily uh, submitted data set that was going through um, um, a, a process that was really largely run um, by the CDC um, through some of their health informatics and the way that they um, input data. And in July, we started to hear murmurs that they were going to be restructuring the way that hospitalization data was going to be collected, that the Department of Health and Human Services was actually going to create some resources and provide some guidance to hospitals, but that they were actually going to pair for the very first time in all of our COVID tracking, not only the definitions and the standards of how that data would be collected, um, but some teeth, some um, real accountability. So what you see here in this sort of purple area with all of these um, um, uh, different events that happen post, these are the opportunities that hospital systems had to come into compliance with these requirements. And what this did was it created an enormous strain on hospital systems to try to get this data um, into shape, um, but there were actual financial incentives for them to do it. Um, and so in October, we saw a dramatic improvement in the quality of hospitalization data. And for the first time in the entire um, um, uh, upswing of COVID um, here in the United States, we started to see the real impact it was having um, in our hospitals. And it started to change the way we started thinking about 
um, our communication to the public about why they should uh, get vaccinated, why they should think about um, um, engaging in social distancing and the other mitigation strategies that were available pre-vaccination um, uh, eligibility uh, to really try to um, impress upon people that um, uh, when hospital capacity um, gets um, stretched to the limits, that it really does um, significantly impact our ability um, to meet really basic public health needs. And so um, these reports um, were really broad. They were well-defined. Um, they had specific um, criteria on reporting, not only what um, was being seen from a surveillance perspective in hospitals, but also around equipment, um, around how many um, uh, patients were on ventilators, where those ventilators were. Um, we also saw that um, uh, voluntary reporting of other comorbidities, including the flu, um, started to be um, included in that data collection. And by October, um, they were solidified and we started to see hospitals. Now, this was not easy for hospitals to do and I wanna underscore that it was a huge lift on hospital systems, but they did do it and it did really greatly improve um, our ability to understand the impact that COVID was having in communities. So this plot shows you the effect that it had on our ability to really see it. So again, you see that variability uh, before the reporting mandate comes into ac um, in action. Um, and then post in action, you see a much um, cleaner view of that data. Um, and you can actually see um, that you have the ability um, to really track those peaks. Just a little information on hospitalization data it is a lagging indicator. So we'll see a surge in cases and then we'll see hospitalization surge between one and two weeks after we see those case surges. And then the, the death data is, of course, a, a further lag from hospitalization data. There are still some open questions that we'll, I'm sure, talk about today um, as we think more closely about hospitalization data, particularly um, what it means right now to understand the staffing allocation as it relates to capacity. What we've heard anecdotally is that we know that there is a staffing shortage, particularly for nurses, and that it's unclear exactly how that's actually showing up um, in our hospitalization data and our capacity assessment. So because that data is typically on an even further lag, um, it is unclear whether or not we have the kind of granularity that we need to know to really understand the sense of urgency, not only around capacity, but also as we navigate these surges around staffing. Um, but again, the hospitalization data is one of the most critical um, indicators that we look at. We know public policymakers, everyone from our governors to our mayors and local leaders are using hospitalization data to um, uh, communicate, to encourage people to get vaccinated, boosted, and also to engage in those mitigation strategies. And so it's important that um, we keep this as a material part, but it also set the standard for what is possible. We still have very limited standards on testing data, case data, and there is a huge opportunity for us to use the example of hospitalization data and scale it to the breadth of COVID data um, that's been collected. Um, and right now, all indications is that is not happening. We haven't received those standards or the support on that. And that has hamstrung a lot of our efforts to really bolster the capacity of some of the other key data sets that we've had uh, throughout the pandemic. So that's the overview, Lainey. I'm going to hand it back over to you. And I'm really excited to engage in this conversation and answer further questions. Thanks so much, Beth. I'm now going to turn to Brian, who will share his experience on the ground at Johns Hopkins throughout this pandemic. Brian, over to you. Thanks, Lane. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I thought I would take a slightly different tack and talk about <clears throat> the experience from the hospital level, but also an individual patient level to show how the way we collect data can inform the way that we take care of patients. So here at Johns Hopkins, we're one of 10 federally funded regional emerging special pathogen treatment centers. Uh, and our, our clinical unit is called the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit. And, uh, you know, for the past seven years, we've been training to provide patient care uh, for patients infected with uh, highly infectious diseases or novel pathogens. We've been conducting research and innovation and also training our staff, but also our community partners to be able to identify patients who might have a novel infectious disease, uh, but also to, to treat those patients and get them to one of our referral centers. And so not surprisingly, we were one of the first units to take care of COVID patients back in March of 2020 before we really understood um, how we could do this safely. 
And so this, I'm not supposed to show this picture because none of us are wearing masks at this point in time, but uh, this is our team the night that we activated for our first uh, transfer in for a, a COVID patient. And I wanted to share with you his story. He's given us permission to share this, um, just to give you a sense of the types of decisions that we really had no information about how to make and we're still learning about in real time. So he was a 40-year-old who had a four-day history of fever and cough. Um, he had recently gone to Florida in February of 2020, one, one week before he became ill, had no past medical history. And on arrival to one of our affiliated um, emergency departments, he was really short of breath. He had a high fever and he was requiring high levels of oxygen. And this is his x-ray showing diffuse infiltrates or shadows throughout the lung, which we now know is, is fairly characteristic of COVID. And shortly after this x-ray was taken, he was placed on a breathing machine um, because we couldn't support his oxygen levels without a, uh, without a ventilator. And so here are some of the questions that we had back in March of 2020. You know, he was already intubated, but we didn't really know what the role of intubation and mechanical ventilation would be. Many of you have heard about putting patients on their belly or proning them to try to improve their oxygenation levels. So we weren't yet sure how effective that would be. Um, there had just been case reports of hydroxychloroquine use in France, potentially as a treatment. Remdesivir was under active study, but you could actually request a, an emergency um, use of remdesivir from the FDA. Uh, people were using steroids in China, but we weren't sure yet um, if they were beneficial. There are other immunomodulators that were available. We were worried about blood clots, but we really didn't know how to anticoagulate patients. And we were really flying blind at that point in time. And our patient ended up being on the breathing machine for almost a month. He was on his belly multiple times. He had some heart dysfunction. He had blood clots. He had a secondary infection. He had profound confusion and delirium for over a month. And he lost 50 pounds during his, his hospital course. This is him actually before he became ill. He's an avid uh, triathlon and, and um, a marathon runner. Um, and this was him after he got home from the hospital. Um, and we recognized at this point in time that we had an opportunity to learn about this brand new disease in real time from the patients that we cared about. But we couldn't do it just from anecdotes and observations. We really needed to, co to compile that data um, into a framework that we can analyze it uh, at a much higher level. And luckily, we had something called the Precision Medicine Analytics Platform, or PMAP, that was already in place at Johns Hopkins, which is an environment where you can bring in data sources from a number of different areas and then um, be able to apply you know, high-level computing and computational statistical modeling uh, to learn from that data and then feed it back into the hands of frontline clinicians so they can use what you learn uh, as they make decisions on the next patients that they see. Um, and so this registry that, that we use is called the JH Crown Registry, um, and it includes any patient who tests positive for SARS-CoV-2 or has a diagnosis of COVID-19, but it also includes any patient who's ever tested for SARS-CoV-2. Now, if you remember back in March of 2020, in order to get tested for COVID, you needed to have a travel history or an exposure history. So this was originally designed to try to capture people who might have COVID, but then test negative. But as, as anyone who's encountered the health system recently, if you come into the hospital or if you're encountering uh, healthcare um, uh, providers, you're usually going to get a COVID test. So we now have well over 100,000 uh, positive outpatients, but 300,000 negative controls and almost 11,000 hospitalized patients with COVID in this registry. Uh, so I wanted to share some of the insights that we've learned. So the first step that we took was to try to understand who is going to progress to severe disease. And, and by that, we mean requiring high levels of oxygen, having to go to the ICU, or perhaps even dying from their COVID. And this graph on the right is a little bit small, but it's a cumulative insulin plot, plot that shows six real patients. And this patient at the bottom here, patient F, has a very low chance of developing severe disease or death. And that's partly because he's very young. He has no comorbidities. He's not obese. And when he shows up to the hospital, he's not short of breath and he doesn't have a fever. So very low risk that, he, that he's going to develop severe disease or death. In marked contrast, there's this patient A who's much older. She's in her 80s. She has underlying diabetes and hypertension and obesity. And when she came to the hospital, she was very short of breath and was very inflamed. And she had a very high likelihood of developing severe disease or death. And this is, this is information you can get just from a snapshot of what someone looks like when they arrive at the hospital. But we can do better. We can actually take the longitudinal data, what happens to them on day one, day two, day three, and update this prediction so that in real time, if you're, if you're taking care of a COVID patient, you can say, hey, what's the chance over the next day 
or the next seven days that this person is going to develop the need for the ICU. And that's just what Matt Robinson and our group did. He created something called the Severe COVID-19 Adaptive Risk Predictor, or SCARP, which is, is available as a web-based tool that anybody can use, where if you input data about your patients, it gives you this rolling prediction of whether or not they're going to develop severe disease or death. But we've also incorporated it into the electronic health record. So if you're taking care of COVID patients in our hospital, you can pull up the list of all the patients that you're dealing with. Each one of these rows is a real patient, and you can see what's the likelihood that this person's going to develop severe disease or death in the next seven days or one day. And this is obviously very important in terms of taking care of an individual patient, having discussions with the patient and their family about you know, what they might want done in the event that they get sicker. But you can also imagine this is really helpful for hospital administrators and people working in clinical operations to understand, hey, based on the patients we have in the hospital now, how many ICU beds are we going to need in the next you know, week or so? How many patients could potentially be safely discharged because we're not worried that they're going to develop severe disease or death? In addition to looking at prediction and how that impacts the way that we treat patients, we can also examine the effectiveness of the, of the therapies that we're using in real time. And so uh, many of you have heard about remdesivir, which is a, an intravenous antiviral medicine that decreases the time to clinical improvement. It's really become the standard of care here in the U.S. when a patient gets hospitalized, particularly if they require oxygen. And before we had large-scale studies of this, you know, we, we were looking at using this drug and whether or not it was effective in real-world populations who weren't represented in clinical trials. And using our data set, we were able to show here again, a cumulative incidence curve of who's going to get better. Um, and people in blue here who received remdesivir had a significant uh, increased chance of getting better and by average improved uh, two days sooner than patients who didn't get remdesivir. So this was just a way of confirming uh, the results of the initial ACT-1 trial, which showed that remdesivir was effective. Uh, we also did the same for tocilizumab, which is an anti-inflammatory drug and this was this was data that we collected before there were large-scale randomized control trials of its benefit. We looked at our first 90 patients who received it, and you can see patients in yellow here who received tocilizumab compared to matched controls had an improvement in mortality. And so we were able to start seeing these signals before we had really, really large randomized control trials telling us that, in fact, this drug is, is beneficial. The last thing I'll show is that this type of data can really help us understand the pathobiology of disease. Um, so Anthony Rosen and Olivia Casciola Rosen have, have made their career on identifying autoantibodies in different types of diseases. And they had a hypothesis that maybe some of the severe COVID we're seeing is mediated by autoantibodies against the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to to get into human cells. And so they looked at patients who had severe disease here, uh, WHO score six to eight, which means they're in the ICU or, or perhaps died from their COVID. And you can see there's a number of patients in this group here in the black bars that have this autoantibody against ACE2, uh, which probably under, underlies some of that severe disease and can suggest ways of treating patients with different anti-inflammatories. Um, so I, I think in, in the future, we can use this type of data to understand the effectiveness of our vaccines and, and, and therapies, particularly in regards to new variants that come about. So we're, we're updating this data set with Omicron um, variant data as we speak. We can try to understand the sequelae of COVID-19, people who get past their acute infection but have long COVID or, or, or post-acute COVID. Uh, and I think we can apply this methodology to create real-time decision tools for other diseases. Um, and if you're interested uh, to hear more about this data, you can check out our website, the COVID-19 Precision Medicine Center of Excellence, that has links to all the different research that we've done with this data set, but also other large um, hospital consortium data sets. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Next, we're going to hear from another physician expert who will give a comprehensive view of the statewide situation. Um, Arnando is going to speak about his experiences leading California's hospitalization data efforts. Arnando, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, absolutely today and um, hoping to share a bit of the California experience and the opportunity I've had to, to work with the Department of Public Health around the data analytics for the hospitalization portion of this. Um, to give you a little bit of background for size and scope, so one of the good things about California is we're large enough and have resources enough to have hundreds of people uh, working, thousands of people really in the public health sector uh, and the emergency response sector. But the challenge it creates is that the, the 
size and diversity throughout the state from urban areas to rural areas. So we have a population around 39 million. We have 58 counties uh, that go all the way from Los Angeles County, which has a population of 10 million, all the way down to Alpine County and the Eastern Sierra that has a, a population of just 1,200 people. Uh, we have 61 local health departments. Uh, there are some cities in large counties like Long Beach uh, and Berkeley that have their own public health department within, within the larger counties. So we have even more health departments than we have counties. We also have 393 general acute care hospitals that are reporting to the, to the federal HHS uh, survey. Approximately 60 to 70 of these hospitals, however, are maternity, special surgery, um, and and uh, chronic vent facilities that are even classified as, as acute care um, that really have not significantly contributed to the, to the COVID response simply because they don't have the, the means or the bed space per se or the expertise uh, to do so. So we factor that into our, our data analytics as well. And this is where the local um, awareness of, of your healthcare situation factors in and looking at the numbers. Uh, licensed beds are listed as over 73,000. But staff beds is, is not anywhere near that high. It's been below 60,000, really close to around 50,000 most of the time. Uh, licensed ICU beds, again, this is where uh, a hospital operational awareness is important because you can't assume we have uh, 11,000 because uh, 3,500 of these are NICU beds where you can't put out or even a pediatric patient with COVID, right? So we, we're really looking at uh, about 8,000 ICU beds available in the state uh, without before surging. Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, uh, the, the uh, infectious disease public health data infrastructure includes a system we call CalReady, California Reportable Disease Information Exchange. Uh, this is utilized by local health departments and some hospital systems to enter data about reportable diseases. Uh, good thing about this data set is it provides case level information, uh, often post discharge. So you can get the not just the single diagnoses or what are you, you know, what are you admitted for, not just COVID, but did you also have heart failure, renal failure, those kinds of things, level of care, how many, how many days in the ICU, length of stay, gender, age, summary ethnic, ethnicity data, all things that are, that aren't in the existing federal HHS data set, but are important for, for some of the analytics around hospital utilization, healthcare utilization. The problem with this data set is, is uh, we don't have the, the uh, lever to mandate reporting and there's incomplete input of data. So when we compare the number of cases uh, of, of, for COVID patients coming into CalReady, with the cases being reported to the federal HHS aggregate data set, we're only getting information into CalReady from about a half to two thirds of the cases that are being reported to the daily survey. So it's helpful information, but not complete. Um, we also have an immune regist uh, immunization registry uh, that's allowing us to track obviously immunizations and, and uh, others. And there are certainly data sets uh, for non-communicable diseases, but those actually are even more delayed reporting than, than we get into CalReady. That's frequently quarterly or annual information about non-communicable diseases and other data sets. So a quick summary, and again, this is our California experience around the, the federal HHS daily survey. Uh, a couple of key points that I would make here. I, I List starting with the strengths of this. It's just wonderful that there's mandated reporting and the and the CMS reimbursement on the line that the hospitals face if they don't report. So uh, so we experience anywhere from 87 percent on the weekends, even though it's supposed to be seven day a week reporting. It's often not. So we lose about five to seven percent of hospital reporting on weekends, up to 95 to 97 percent often during our weekday. So we have excellent. Uh, uh, compliance with reporting and we get very comprehensive data. Um, other strength is a real time um, data, near real time, essentially a day delayed um, for operating decision making. So it's very easy to track um, uh, recent surges in new cases. It's very easy to track how close to your ICC you're getting to in terms of ICU availability. And it allows uh, for data, it provides data that allows for operational decision making around those metrics, including we have a, a whole uh, hospital surge 
uh, division that, that we provide the data for in the hospital surge, uh, working with California Civil Emergency Services that does a lot of logistics and su su supply procurement, PPE for hospital staff. We um, have been working at a state level with uh, the healthcare staffing agencies to bring in literally thousands of, of hospital workers, paramedics, uh, to the California system and make them available for over for overburden policies. And then we've also used this hospital data to drive NPI policies on the public health level. So back in December of 2020, when we were hitting our winter surge, we actually used uh, an ICU availability that dropped below 15% statewide, trigger our, our state stay at home order back then. And again, these hospital metrics have really driven policies around masking, mandatory indoor masking, closing sectors like restaurants and bars, and all of that, that the non-pharmaceutical intervention, policy interventions have been driven, not just by case data and testing data, but very much by the healthcare data that we have uh, analyzed and made available to decision makers and leaders at the public health level. Um, Another strength is the comprehensive number of variables. Uh, we have a lot of hospitals complaining a bit, but they've been compliant again with the reporting. This survey, if you may recall, started with 40 or 60 questions. I believe there's somewhere upward of 120, 140 variables or question now, but it provides a lot of data on beds and patients and ICU numbers and PPE and staffing availability and, and ther therapeutics availability. So that, that's one of its strengths. There's also some limited ability to adjust to adjust uh, some of these variables locally. So I'll give a couple of examples. The pediatric bed and uh, pediatric ICU variables that were added just this week um, to the survey, we've actually uh, been requesting those of hospitals for several months and we've been collecting that, that pediatric data. Um, another example that I will give, and I mentioned one of the gaps here is the, the new additions data. So what one of the problematic issues we had with the new admissions uh, dictionary definition of the variable is uh, a confirmed new admission as someone admitted yesterday with a confirmed test. But then on hospital day two, that person drops off. So you either had a confirmed admission or suspected admission. And the problem is you don't know what happens to the suspected admissions because on day two, they drop off of any variable. They're not reported. So you don't know what percentage of those suspected patients turned out to be positive. So we actually added a variable in California to include um, uh, conversion positive from yesterday that were recently admitted. Because what we have found is, especially in days of short testing shortages, or we have in rural hospitals who send out their tests and don't have in-house testing capability, that if you just look at confirmed admissions from yesterday, you're actually missing about 30% or we were missing about 30%. Someone gets admitted at 9 p.m., their test hasn't resulted yet, so they have to be re reported as suspected, and then their, their test comes back at 2 a.m. as positive. So you don't capture that unless you create a, another variable to capture that and, and make up for the for the strictness of the data dictionary definition. So again, the ability to adjust some of these variables locally uh, has uh, allowed us to apply uh, this to look at things that are not available in the existing federal data set. Um, key local inputs, um, this, this isn't a dormant process. You have to work with the survey very much uh, to ensure the quality and the verification. Uh, we have a team of people looking at the data, noticing inconsistency and reporting, noticing blank data fields from many hospitals that we had a team that would often say, hey, this variable is important. Let's reach out to these health systems. Let's reach out to these hospitals, stress the importance of these variables and why they are. So we, we have spent a lot of time um, and manual work uh, and calls uh, and building relationships to ensure the quality of the data that is uh, going into the, uh, into the survey that is comprehensive and, and uh, accurate to true numbers. Um, the other critical thing is hospital operations and emergency management expertise for interpreting and reviewing this data. There are many people in the public health department, epidemiologists who have very little hospital experience. They don't understand often what a surge bed is. 
Um, they, um, I answered a question just a couple days ago about the distinction or the difference between hospital utilization and hospital census. So I, I think looking at these metrics requires some experience in hospital operations and even emergency management. Uh, the, the, real, the realization that uh, most search, you know, the, the template for surge uh, response and, and emergency management uh, disaster planning is that healthcare be able to increase capacity by 20%. Just understanding what hospitals are capable of doing helps, helps understand uh, uh, and lead the analysis of this information. Um, a gaps that I would point out is that uh, this particular survey is event specific and will go away. So at some point, the mandated requirement of the federal government presumably go away. And what happens if you still feel you need the data? Certain areas might still be more impacted while the rest of the country um, um, is, is seeing a, a waning of, of COVID impact. Or what do we do with the next event, uh, right? So it would be great if there was some existing system um, and even local the state level that mandates this kind of reporting and gets us this quality uh, near real-time data for any future event with care impacts. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there, there are some uh, problematic variables. I mentioned the issue of the new admissions variable. I would also point out that the uh, da uh, data dictionary definition of available beds, um, and I think it was mentioned earlier by the first speaker that we have um, we don't have great eyes on healthcare capacity for staffing. Um, the, the challenge with the available beds variables, it's defined as staffed or staffable with available resources, but people interpret available resources very differently. We've tried to push the concept that this is, this is the nursing staff that you have at home that can get called in to staff these beds but most hospitals continue to interpret this as, well, if I had the staffing I could in this bed, the problem we all know is that staffing is the critical uh, shortage uh, and resource uh, on the healthcare side at this point. And so we are uh, clearly seeing an over-reporting of available beds metric. If you look at California, it looks like 20 or 30 percent of our med surge beds are open and available. And the reality is that those numbers are inaccurate. Those beds are not staffed. We've confirmed this through um, our EMS system. We have a uh, EM resource and, uh, and ReadyNet are two software platforms used uh, in EMS and they, they're uh, available to do uh, have bed playing. Uh, so it's really day-to-day -day operational. How many ICU beds do you have? How many med surge beds do you have? That's the kind of information really used locally for multi-casualty incidents and things like that. And if you look at beta availability for through those, it's much, much less that's being reported through this, uh, this HHS data. Okay, so how do we operationalize this uh, in California? You know, this that we there's an Excel spray that comes every day that has those 140 variables along the columns and the 393 hospitals on the rows. So it's a massive Excel spreadsheet. How do you then operationalize and make that useful? Um, we've had many uh, data analytics. We have a whole team essentially that processes this data and creates a dashboard. So we have a dashboard here and it may be difficult for you to see, but there are the, these are, are uh, different tabs. We actually include testing data, um, case data, as was mentioned, testing positivity, doubling time, um, case rates, all that in other tabs. Uh, plays the hospital data uh, here. So again, taking these metrics and determining which ones are important. What's the rate of change of new admissions? What's the present uh, COVID positivity in the med surge hospital space? Present COVID positivity in the ICU space? ICU availability? All of these metrics that we've decided are critical key metrics. We also set thresholds, and you can see the color coding here between tan and orange and red or P in terms of more alarming thresholds and, and how the system is looking. Um, in the um, upper left here, you can actually select the view. So you do this by county. You can do aggregate the counties by regions. We have five or six different regions in California. And so there are many to make quite flexible. So this we call our snapshot view. We've also built what's called a hospital burden score. So literally looking at every hospital in the system, 
uh, and what percentage of ICU is available, how many of your ICU patients are in surge ICU space, how many are in ED overflow space, it all goes into building a score. So we've, we've essentially tried to uh, um, create an objective measure of hospital burden. Uh, and then we take these high risk, the highest scores, and we have a team of uh, CDPH staff that call these hospitals, not only to verify these numbers, but to ask them about their gaps and their needs for support, whether it's staffing, whether it's supplies uh, and things like that. Uh, we created in this visualization tab up here that circled uh, in red, it's the trending function. So to the left side of this, you can actually select about 40 different variables. This one, uh, as an example, happens to be the percent of new, the number of new COVID admissions. Um, this toggle bar that's blue, you can uh, select the date range going back a day, a month, um, three months back to the beginning of the data collection. And then in, you can also select uh, the, the entire state. You can select individual counties. You can uh, select geographic regions. Here, so this just happens to be from the one time the data was collected for all our local health officer regions in California, and then ultimately for, for the most customizable data pools from this data set, um, we created this table builder. Uh, this happens to be hospital met the pull down list on the to the lower left of the screenshot. You can see includes many of the variables. You check off the ones you want. You can check off one, multiple, all of them. And then but underneath this uh, pull-down menu here, you also then select the date range with a toggle bar. And uh, there's you can select the state, regions, or the county. So you can get a grid of very customizable data pull and for analyses and trending and calculating percentages and, and all of that kind of work. Um, we also, so this dashboard is used extensively by a number of state uh, public health people, but we've also made it available at the local officer level. So we have uh, public health access to all of this data. They often use it to look at their own individual metrics that drive local decision making um, at the local health officer and, and healthcare coalition level locally in, in counties and regions. And, and then I would say just quickly moving forward, it, it would be wonderful to establish this kind of, of data set of hospital metrics. Um, certainly federally, and, and but in California specifically, um, that is similar hospital data really for any healthcare emergency event. Uh, there may be an event in, in that state specific that doesn't uh, create a, a federal response, but you may want, uh, well, we have wildfires in California and we have earthquakes and we've evacuated entire hospitals and nursing homes and all of that before and having real-time data uh, on uh, for those uh, state level events and, and future federal level events uh, would be really critical. And ultimately the, the mix of this data, of the, all the health information exchange conversations that you're aware of at different levels, even between hospitals and health systems, were really important to have also between public health and healthcare. So you can pull um, you know, relevant information and make this a more robust experience. Thank you very much. And that was a perfect transition to our final speaker, who we'll hear from briefly, and then we'll move into Q&A. Craig is going to talk about the role of health information exchanges when dealing with COVID-19 data and their role in future public health data modernization and accessibility. Craig, over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a great transition, because um, I would like to zoom out a little bit and talk through you know, what we were doing before the pandemic, uh, if you can remember back before March 2020. And, um, and how we think we can expand afterwards. Um, so just as a quick level setting, uh, CRISP is the state designated HIE for Maryland. Uh, we also work with a number of affiliate HIEs, um, mostly in the mid-Atlantic, but also uh, some faraway places. And um, really what HIEs have always been doing, or, or the, the successful ones, is linking data from different providers and sharing that for multiple use cases in safe and appropriate ways. And so let's... Um, Let's talk through what some of those use cases are and um, and then how COVID fit in. Uh, so of course, uh, most of what we do is putting data at the point of care. Uh, so when a, a provider goes to uh, visit Dr. Garibaldi in the emergency department uh, or in his clinic, they can see, he can see exactly what's happened in other places. You can also check things like the prescription drug monitoring program and um, get a good sense of the patient history and background. We also push alerts. So if a patient has been to that hospital, 
uh, they can, their primary care physician or a care coordinator can follow up appropriately. Then we do a lot related to reporting, both population health uh, from claims, but also public health reporting and, and different important aspects. And, um, and this has all really been a focus in, into transitioning into maybe what I would call uh, a, a health data utility, uh, which is really more, as we just heard, of that combination of public health data and traditional HIE use cases. And so I will not go through these. Uh, it's actually fun to be reminded of all the work we've done, um, but maybe to emphasize a few things that, that I think really highlight how an HIE can support public health. Um, first, I mentioned all of those notifications we send when a patient goes to the hospital. We repurpose that exact same system using confirmed case data to do things like notify EMS first responders if they transported someone who later tested positive for COVID. Uh, it's the same infrastructure as new data being used for a new purpose. Uh, similarly, um, we receive a lot of data from hospitals already, um, but we leveraged a daily survey and mostly automated it so that hospitals could track surge capacity, open beds, um, and the state could understand a sense of cases like we just heard about in California. Um, we also were doing some more creative things like, for example, uh, through all of our various data sets, we know a lot about individuals. Uh, we know things like their race and ethnicity based on hospital uh, ADT feeds, but also Medicare and Medicaid claims. And so when we were lacking that information to, to look at equity of distribution of different therapeutics and uh, perhaps impact of COVID, um, we could really support the state in getting a better view. Uh, most of this was possible because of a new uh, kind of our cloud-based data lake infrastructure. I'm not going to go through it in detail, and I certainly won't speak to this slide in detail, but I think the most important aspect here is that on this far side where you can see a bunch of different pipes going into our Insights data lake, um, most of those existed well before COVID. We were already getting uh, a, a lot of claims data from hospitals, Medicare, Medicaid. We were already getting rosters of patients from primary care physicians. We were already getting hospital and skilled nursing facility admission discharge transfer feeds. And so we could reuse that exact same data for all these new use cases. And it really allowed for things like driving contact tracing at the state level, uh, pushing surveillance information for public health officials, uh, creating more perspective for hospitals and nursing homes as they were looking to transfer data. And, um, and it, I think it's just really important to emphasize that we had a lot of components of this infrastructure uh, kind of pre-pandemic. And it's going to be important to think through how can we reuse what we have in the most efficient ways so that hospitals are not having to create new feeds to all these new different places or adhere to new specifications as administrations change. Because uh, hopefully, if they can share the data once uh, through an HIE or some other kind of local appropriate group, uh, we can make that data useful in all sorts of different use cases um, and ultimately actually reduce burden on the provider side while increasing functionality. Uh, maybe a final really good example of that is what we call our vaccine data service. Uh, when the vaccinations were first coming out, we thought it was really important to let a clinician see their entire roster of patients, uh, their real-time vaccination status, and then also certain characteristics about those patients, their age, chronic conditions, race, ethnicity, uh, zip code, so that the clinicians could maybe task a care manager in their office to reach out to a specific uh, group of patients, maybe uh, those who were aged and had a first dose but not a second dose within the appropriate time period. And it allowed the trusted source uh, for patients to be proactive using information, again, from the state through the HIE, through a tool they're already familiar with using. Um, and tools like this can be expanded beyond uh, COVID vaccinations to look at things like either flu or maybe referrals to the diabetes prevention programs or all sorts of different use cases that um, hopefully can improve health and wellness well beyond uh, this pandemic. Um, so with that, it was a lot very quickly, but I'm glad to turn it back over and uh, hopefully answer some questions. Thanks so much, Craig. 
And I'm going to go straight into q and I do see your questions coming in. Thank you to those who are submitting them. We have several questions around the same topic. So I'm going, to, I'm going to ask an aggregate question, Brian. I'm sending it to you first as the boots on the ground hospital perspective. And then Craig and Hernando, I'd like you to weigh in on, um, on the data side. So um, here's, here's the gist. Are we able to distinguish between hospitalizations caused by COVID-19 versus individuals who are hospitalized for some other reason, and it turns out that they have asymptomatic or a very mild case of COVID? So Brian, how about first to first you and then Craig and Hernando, I hope you can pick it up. Sure, this is a really um, complicated question. I think the short answer is yes, we can, but there's a lot of gray in that answer, right? So. You know, it's very easy to use hospital level data to, to figure out if someone went to the intensive care unit with COVID pneumonia and went on the ventilator. It's also very easy to see if someone came in with a broken leg and tested positive for COVID, but never developed any vital sign abnormalities, never had a pneumonia, never had any uh, issues related to COVID. What's really tough is people, I'll give you a good example of people who have chronic medical conditions who then get COVID and they come in because their blood sugar is really, really high and they have to be treated with IV insulin in the hospital, but they don't have shortness of breath. Well, COVID probably caused that, but they didn't really have a COVID pneumonia. It's just that COVID caused their blood sugar to go high or someone who feels really ill from their COVID and misses their dialysis session. And so then comes into the hospital because they need urgent dialysis, right? They're not there for COVID pneumonia, but COVID is what caused them to need to come to the hospital. So I think there's a lot of gray in that, but we do have the ability, if we, if we create the right definitions for what we're gonna call symptomatic COVID, we, we can use hospital level data, particularly ICD-10 codes to figure out who really came to the hospital because COVID made them ill versus they came for another reason and were found to have COVID because COVID is spreading very widely in their community. Thanks, Brian. And how about um, Craig and then Arnaldo, can you, can you give us your perspective on this one? Yeah, I mean, I first completely agree with Brian. Um, it's maybe a good example of where data can be challenging because we know who's in the hospital. We know who has COVID. We don't know necessarily which came first. Um, and, and the data we get is very messy. And um, the technologists are not the right people to try and interpret it. Um, so I do agree it involves a lot of communication and a partnership to figure out what is each hospital's feed or what is their data source trying to tell us in their format. And the, the more specification and consistency we have, certainly the better it will be. Thanks, and Hernando, your perspective? Yeah, I agree with both of the previous answers. I, I think uh, certain data elements are e certainly easier to define. Confirm positive test, boom, that one's kind of easy, right? You have a lab test that's positive or not. You can talk about false positive and false negative. That's an easy one for it. But this variable, as mentioned, is de the definition of with versus for can be can be difficult to align. What we have is again having so many hospitals. We have multiple large health systems. Um, we have a UC, UC of count. You know, we have six major centers. Permanente has thirty hospitals. We have Dignity. We have Sutter. We have uh, we have Adventist. We have several large players that have ten or more hospitals. And a lot of collaborate around this. The challenge is that UC is defining with COVID or in for COVID differently than Kaiser is defining it, right? But at least they have a system-wide uh, version already. So we're halfway there and we're working with them to try and align those two definitions and we're getting information from them. So at least we have limited information in, in the UC system we're having, we're seeing about this much with versus four in the Kaiser system, we're seeing this much with and four and playing with that, but working towards a more uniform definition to, to give some better trail on that. Thanks. And we have several questions coming in about the the state level view. And the um, the the summary is when you think about your state, and we have three Marylanders and one Californian on this panel. So Craig, I'm going to ask you to represent the Marylanders, and then Hernando, you you are our Californian. Um, so Craig, this will go to you you first. When you think about hospitalization data and what the last two years or so have have been like, what is the one thing? that you think your state has done the best in this area and that you hope will be carried forward and an important lesson learned? Well, that's a big responsibility <laughs> for me to answer for the Marylanders. Um, maybe what I'll say is I'm, I'm consistently very proud of the collaboration we have across healthcare systems. 
I think very early on, our hospitals wanted to be transparent. They wanted to share data. They wanted to understand their situation regionally and statewide so that we could get the right resources and they could coordinate and do what's best for patients. I think that's been, it's been a longstanding feature of Maryland because of our total cost of care model and, and different programs. But I think it's been really great to look at, at how willing and um, how much effort people have been putting into the collaboration across systems. I think you represented the Marylanders well. Thanks, Craig. And Hernando, same question for you about California. You know, I would have for the answer. I think the collaboration has been critical. Uh, not only, as I mentioned, that we have um, people in the, in the state public health level talking with individual health systems and even large health systems, but we've also worked closely with the California Hospital Association. Uh, and we've done several seminars to talk about data and where the state is. And we have calls with um, CEOs from hospitals and, and health systems and, and the individual, individual reach out. And that collaboration has really improved, verified the data and helped drive a lot of the state response to support the health systems. Thanks, Hernando. And you will have the last word because we're quickly coming up on the hour. So that's all the time that we have for questions today. Unfortunately, I want to thank all of our speakers again for joining us and for sharing their expertise. Their insights are critical for the current pandemic, but also as we anticipate future needs of the healthcare system. The next Pandemic Data Initiative Forum will be on March 18th, 2022 at 12 p.m. You can pre-register for that event at the registration page for today's session, or you can use the banner that you see on the screen. Thank you to our audience for joining us. As always, this forum will be archived and available at coronavirus.jhu.edu. Until next time, thanks and stay safe.